All right, so we are going to go ahead and get started. As usual, you guys should all have your packets. We have free water. We have some pens if anybody needs the pens. Um, you'll notice something a little different in your packets this time. We don't just have a promotional for the next talk that we offer, but you're also getting like a full newsletter that lists the next couple of talks. So you can plan ahead a little bit better. So today we are going to be talking about how to use CBD for health and wellness. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Colleen. Some people call me Lena. And I was a former neuroscience researcher as well as being a clinical nutritionist. I actually did a post baccalaureate fellowship researching cannabinoids and CBD. So that's my background in that regard. And then the other part of it, Marty, our pharmacist, clinical nutritionist, and herbalist will be covering. There we go. All right, so our agenda for today, I'm going to be taking you through the endocannabinoid system basics. Then Marty's gonna take over and he's gonna go over CBD 101, including what is CBD, hemp versus marijuana, what are the different types of CBD, is it safe, and then using CBD for health, so how it applies to pain and inflammation, mental health and sleep, neurodegenerative disorders, and then we'll finish off by giving you guys some frequently asked questions in the end. So the first thing we'll go over is what exactly is the endocannabinoid system? So everyone has an endocannabinoid system. Endo just means within us, and cannabinoid, it means derived from the cannabis plant, hemp, marijuana, but we make these compounds within ourselves as well. So it's not just exogenously that we get them from hemp, we make them too. So this system is very important in terms of maintaining homeostasis for your body. It just means that it's you know, crucial for regulating your various body systems. It tries to keep you in its own balance. So we make these naturally, as I said, within our own body to work with that system. And this system is involved in regulating things like pain and inflammation, sleep, mood, and honestly, so much more. So we're gonna go over the basics of the endocannabinoid system. And I know I'm probably giving some of you flashbacks to like high school biology or physiology by this picture, but just bear with me and I'll explain what it is that we're looking at and how all of this works. So what we're looking at right here, this is just a nerve. And you can see in the beginning, at the first part of the nerve, you have cannabinoids actually inside it. That's where they hang out until it's time for them to be released. And when your body decides that it's time to use them, it just pushes them out towards whatever it's sending the signal to. So that's all it is that we're looking at, just to kind of show you that this is how it works. This is where it is. So the three basic components of the endocannabinoid system are are endocannabinoids themselves. You can think of them as being messages. They hang around, they don't do anything until your body needs to use them, and then it uses those to send a message out to somewhere in your body. There's receptors, which are basically just message receivers. Your body sends a, a cannabinoid as a message, and then something else receives that message and decides to act upon it. The receptors are mostly CB1 and CB2. CB1 is found in your brain and in your nerves, whereas CB2 is mostly found on immune cells. This is how CBD can apply both to like your mental health, for pain, and also for inflammation, since it's on your immune cells. CB here just stands for cannabinoid, so cannabinoid 1, cannabinoid 2. They weren't particularly inventive when they were making the names that day, I guess. And then the last part of this are enzymes. Now these are just what you can think of as a message garbage system. So your body sends out an endocannabinoid message, the receptors receive it, and then to keep the receptors from getting the same message over and over, like sending the same text message multiple times, once you get it once, that's enough. You, you got it, you understood it. Your body doesn't need to keep getting the signal, and so these enzymes basically come and clear this away. So to give you a perspective of how absolutely vast the endocannabinoid system is inside of your body, particularly your nervous system, is in my hand, that's my own picture, there is a rat brain. It's a tiny little rat brain. It's about, mm, yeah, big. They're not very large. 
When we do neuroscience research, we have a fancy thing that we call a brain atlas. It basically is a map. It's just all it is. It's a map of the brain at various points and what it's supposed to look like so that when you're looking at it, you know just where you are. That's all it is. So in that tiny, tiny little rat brain, you have this atlas with this tiny, tiny little section that's circled in red that you can see. So think about just how absolutely minute this is. This colored image is, this, is a colored image of that section circled in red. Every single green piece that you see, and those are thousands of green dots, are cannabinoid receptors. If you're confused? Yes. What page? I didn't include this. Okay. I apologize. I didn't include that in the printout. No, it doesn't really translate well into printing out into PowerPoint slides. And I just wanted to give you more of a visual just to show you how absolutely vast this is. In this tiny little section, in this tiny little brain, there's literally thousands of these receptors. So that's quite how vast it is. And that's all I wanted to get across here. So after giving you a basic little neuroscience lesson, um, how do outside cannabinoids factor into the endocannabinoid system? So we make our own. We saw that. They sat in the nerves. Our body releases them out. But how does the outside one? And this is where me going over the enzymes and the receptors is actually important. So some outside cannabinoids, such as THC, can bind with the endocannabinoid system. It can bind with the receptors. However, others like CBD cannot, or at least not enough to matter, actually bind with that system, not directly. What it can do, however, is keep you from breaking down your own cannabinoids, and that makes them more effective. So I talked about enzymes being used as a garbage system within the endocannabinoids, that it cleans out those messages. Well, sometimes you might actually need that message out for longer. If you consider, say, when you had worked a shift and your boss put a message up at the desk, if the first person who saw it just tore down the message and no one else got to see it, it's not a very useful message. This can help your body keep those messages there for longer and continue on with keeping that system in balance by taking CBD from the outside. The cannabinoids can also regulate through other receptors not specifically related to the endocannabinoid system. Specifically, they can act on mood by activating certain receptors that we know deal with depression and anxiety. For example, serotonin receptors, which are famous in terms of regulating depression, things like SSRIs, this is what they work on, and so does CBD. Pain reduction through modulating pain receptors. It actually tamps down your body's own signals for pain. And then inflammation reduction through modulating immune signals. As I said, we have some receptors that are on the immune cells themselves, and CBD can help to play with that. All right, so Marty's section is the next. Does anyone have any questions for me before I pass the baton over to him? No? Perfect. Okay, I am wired for sound. <laughs> okay, so where Colleen was talking a little bit more the educational side of things, I'm going to be talking more about the practical side of things. One of the huge benefits, as she mentioned with this, is pain management, pain symptom. Does anybody here have any, say, pain stiffness in your hands, like right now? Is, or an area where you can apply say you know, Mary where you can apply to your skin like right now like your neck or something like that okay let me give you a little sample of a lotion and what I'd like you to do is rub it on you want some rub it in and then later we're going to talk about it anybody else and if you want more yep just rub it in wherever you have an issue anybody else okay this, by the way, will be over here, and you can even um, fill up little sample containers to take with you if you choose to do that. Okay, so let's talk about the real basics of CBD. 
CBD 101. What exactly is it? Um, CBD is in a family called a cannabinoid. So this is a, a bigger family that actually contains close to 100 different compounds. Um, CBD and THC are the two most famous cannabinoids that people would have uh, found out about. Um, different types of hemp plants have different levels of these compounds in them. Marijuana is bred specifically to be high in THC to get you high, and it will be low in CBD naturally. Industrial hemp, which is what we're talking about today, is naturally high in CBD and low in THC. And in fact, CBD can counteract the high caused by THC. So obviously with marijuana, they want to emphasize the high and they don't want the, the, the downer there. So that's why marijuana is bred that way. Historically, these were made illegal at the same time, both marijuana and industrial hemp. Industrial hemp should never have been made illegal. They look identical. If you saw a field, you wouldn't know which one was in the field. So maybe it was partly due to regulation, but they just classified them this way. It wasn't until about four years ago that federally industrial hemp became fully legal in every state. So this is, yes, there are certain states that allow marijuana sales. We're not one of those. The states around us all do, but we don't do recreational marijuana um, for public use. Uh, with yeah. So does that make you like high? Is it, I'm just worried from having it outside. Driving. It zero chance, and I will go through that very thoroughly in just a few minutes. Um, so the um, the unfortunately the illegalization of hemp removed a lot of research that would have gone on, and since this became legal four years ago and a little bit before that, because some states it was legal because of they already allowed marijuana. So there was CBD sales in stores before we did in New Hampshire and the other states that don't have marijuana uh, legality. Um, there, there was b the beginnings of research and showing how wonderful these products are. And as Colleen said, this endocannabinoid system is internal to us. So this feeds directly into our own system. So technically, this is like a nutritional supplement not like taking an herb like valerian for sleep or something like that. This is, this is something like we need vitamin D and it's like taking a vitamin D supplement is a nutritional support. Technically taking CBD products is like that as well. So this, all the different types you see there um, and that, that's listed as full spectrum cannabinoid and I'll go into that in a minute. Full spectrum means every component found in the in the industrial hemp plant is present in a full spectrum CBD product. And that's going to be, that's important for its overall effect because these work together like an army. They call it synergistic. They call it an entourage effect where you're using a group of things to come together and they might have a little, a little tweak to help a particular area where they help it in general. Like THC is very good for pain management, a really, really micro dose. So yes, this will, con the CBD, that's legal contains THC, but at a very, very, very low dose, but enough to help enhance its, its effect. So again, CBD, um, they, the word for that, where the family is called a cannabinoid, CBD is called cannabidiol. That's its, its official name. Um, again, that is the major ingredient in hemp, but there's a little confusion when it says, someone says, I'm taking a CBD product. Well, what exactly are you taking? CBD is only one cannabinoid, and most good hemp products contain all of the cannabinoids. So technically, with the products we sell, you're not getting just CBD. You're getting all the other products that are involved. But, but as a slang term, CBD can refer to itself isolated as only by itself. It can refer to CBD in full spectrum, like is, is shown here. And it can also be anything in between those two. It could have less components, um, but they still slang call it CBD. So it's a little confusing in that regard, but that's 
that's the state of the industry. So how exactly does it work? As Colleen mentioned, this works with your endocannabinoid system and helps support as many functions. This system uh, is involved in receptors, as she said, that regulate a lot of different functions in your body. That's called homeostasis. It helps systems just to work better. And therefore, you know, how could one product help with sleep, anxiety, and, and pain? Well, it's because the system regulates that, not, the, not these individual products. That's why it's, I think it's such a wonderful addition to uh, the natural toolbox, so to speak. So again, as she mentioned, the CBD doesn't bind actually to the receptors itself. THC does do that. Um, so there is THC in a full spectrum. There is some direct interaction with that receptor. But it also works just to help keep these present in your system more. And, and actually, one of the things that nourishes your endocannabinoid system is omega-3s, like fish oil. So part of their anti-inflammatory effect is by working on the endocannabinoid system to work better. So it's kind of an interplay between these things. Different ways of getting this into your system orally would be uh, oils. We'll talk about later about dosing, but generally you would just put, put that under your tongue, uh, swallowing capsules or chewing up gummies to get it into your system for what's called a whole body or systemic effect. Topicals, like you just uh, applied now, they come in lotions, balms, and oils, and that will give you more immediate relief. Uh, again, we'll talk about dosing for oral, but it may take a little while to find your dose. I'll explain that later. But with topicals, oftentimes you get the effect right away. Um, I was working in my yard and I stumbled and I fell and I hurt my hip, went inside, grabbed the CBD roll on, put it on, 10 minutes later, I, was, I didn't even know I hurt myself. It, it really works fast, it's amazing. Um, and then certainly it can be smoked, which is highly not recommended, and it can also be vaped, which is also highly not recommended to use those forms. So again, is this like marijuana and will it get me high? Here's your answer to your question. Let's compare CBD to THC. First of all, CBD, it is not psychoactive. It has zero psychoactive effect, none. It is non-addictive, and it will not and cannot get you high. The product we carry, you could eat everything we have in the store, and you would not get high from that. Unfortunately, I've had people come in my store telling me they bought this locally, and they were high from it. So there's poor, and we'll talk about poor regulation, but this is an area, this particular topic is really unregulated by the government. I don't know why they're not enforcing this, but they're not. Uh, so there's lots of problems with it. In terms of its uses, anti-inflammatory, pain relieving, regulates your immune system, helps with anxiety, helps with sleep. So it has a, a whole variety of things. Um, migraine headaches, PTSD, uh, it just, there's, there's a lot of different things that this helps with. In terms of risks, extremely minimal. Um, th if you look on the internet about interactions, drug interactions with CBD, they're referring to, there's a drug called Epidiolex that is sold on prescription. It's a synthetic CBD only product and that's the product that if you take that, you will get major drug interactions and major liver damage potentially with that product. The reason is because the dosing is super, super high. When we get into dosing, I'll be recommending that we start with a 10 milligram per day dose. If I were on Epidoliax as a, as a prescription customer, my dose would be about 2,500 milligrams a day. So you're talking magnitudes higher, and that's where the problems come in with drug interactions in your body is this major, major dose um, of going on. So on the other hand, we've got THC. This, again, is the famous one for addiction and for the high that you get from marijuana, and it is truly addicting. Um, it is highly regulated, obviously. You're aware of that. This is called a Schedule One drug, which is federally illegal. So although it's sold in states legally, it's federally illegal. And in pharmacy law, states are not allowed to make federal law more lax. So if you have a, a law federally, you have to follow it, or you can make it more restrictive. When I was a pharmacist, uh, first out of school, I worked down in Maryland, 
and down there they had a um, over-the-counter product they called Robitussin with codeine and you could buy this codeine product over the counter. When I got to New Hampshire, they called that a Schedule 5 drug, by the way. So marijuana is a Schedule 1. Opioids like oxycodone are Schedule 2, and they go up from there. Things like Valium and Xanax, they're Schedule 4. Uh, so Schedule 5 is kind of a quasi uh, area. And when I came to New Hampshire, our law here in New Hampshire is you have to have a prescription for to buy Robitussin with codeine. So they can make the rules more strict in the state, but they can't make them less strict than the federal law. So why it's federally illegal, but the state allows it to be legal is just one of those areas where they've just decided to do it. Um, so again, it is federally illegal. There are uses for THC, um, things like pain, sleep, glaucoma, anti-inflammatory, and especially nausea related to cancer treatments. There's some really effective use there. And unfortunately, though, there are the risks involved with it. Anxiety and psychosis with continued use are real problems. There are major drug interactions and liver toxicity. And certainly, if you're dealing with a non-dispensary product, you know, we, we have dispensaries here in New Hampshire. You get a medical card, you can go buy it. Those are highly regulated, hopefully, forms of marijuana. But when you're buying it off the street, you may end up with fentanyl or anything else that could be in there along with it. Okay, let's get back into the types of CBD, and I mentioned before, and I'll just bring all these up here, the different ways of getting CBD and the various types available. Uh, we'll start with the full spectrum. So again, on the right, you have all the components found in the CBD plant. The THC um, is, is there. Uh, so this is, again, is the the, the industrial hemp plant. It does contain trace amounts of THC. Um, that is, again, that's present for a, a therapeutic level. And when it has there, should include all cannabinoids and compounds. The should is relative to the state of our industry, not how they classify it. So full spectrum should be all of them, all of them in there. But some companies don't do that. So you can't rely on a company telling you it's full spectrum unless you have a way of verifying that. So the full spectrum, again, gives you a much broader effect, um, superior effect than the other two. I'll go to the opposite end, the isolate only. There are products you can go in and buy that's labeled just CBD, and theoretically, all the other components have been removed, and it's just CBD only. And then in between, we they call it broad spectrum, in general, broad spectrum usually refers to they merely remove the THC only, and you have all the other components. But the, broad, the term broad spectrum, again, is misused in other manufacturers, and it is, um, could be anything. You just don't know what you're getting. But uh, technically, again, THC-free is the issue there. Um, so. In terms of the, just a direct comparison of CBD full spectrum to isolated spectrum, this gives you a dose response curve. You take a dose, how quickly do you get a response, how long does it last, and you can see the full spectrum goes up higher, faster, stays up, and comes down. Isolate doesn't do as good of a job. Um, it, it, and even the, I think that's one reason the prescription drug, by the way, the prescription drug is primarily used for a severe form of epilepsy, um, and it's effective for that. But I think it's the isolation is causing the dose need to go higher and higher just to get a good effect. So in my opinion, they would do a great job with um, using a CBD full spectrum product, not an isolate. In fact, the, uh, one of the first therapeutic recognitions of CBD was called Charlotte's Web, and it was a, uh, a full spectrum CBD product that helped a kid who had epilepsy that could not be treated with drugs and they found CBD and used that and it worked great. So um, it's really pretty amazing. Okay, so again, I mentioned that this has THC in it. So if it's in there, am I, not, am I gonna get high? Nope, the reason is because the amount of THC that's allowed to be in there is 0.3% or lower to be classified federally legal. There's a point at which the FDA says, technically it's not even in there. Um, unfortunately, some of their decisions about not being in there is not so good. Like, for instance, they say, um, like trans fats, which are very hard on the body, 
if you have a half a gram or less per serving, they call it zero. People with celiac disease, they allow gluten to be in, in gluten-free products as long as it doesn't cause a celiac person to react. So there are still, they can be levels of these things in there. The, the government considers it zero, but in this case, they're considering 0.3% as being really absent from the product, although it has a really important effect. As a comparison, marijuana runs 5%, and I believe up to 20%. So you're talking a huge, huge difference in the amount. So again, this is considered legal, um, and it does not cause high at any, in any way or impairment, but these THC levels are really needed to help the product to work better. Uh, now, in terms of drug screening, these are the quick screenings that you might have, like for a driver, you know, CD, for a CDL license, things like that. Um, they where they do a saliva or urine test. These tests are designed to recognize the cannabinoid family, not the individual cannabinoids. So, if you are subject to those, you don't want to use this until you get cleared by your employer to be able to do this. They can always do a confirmatory blood test to show individual molecules, how much CBD is in your blood, how much THC is in your blood, and they'll know you're not inebriated by using that product. My opinion is there's a lot of people driving on opioids and, or flying on opioids, you know, pilots, and it would be much, much better if they were on uh, CBD products for that particular reason, and it's easy to find it in the bloodstream if they do it properly. So the false you get from these screenings, you can get with a CBD isolate only. You can still get a positive drug test, potentially. So is it safe? Uh, yes, it is extremely safe. But as I mentioned before, there's not much regulation going on with uh, CBD and unfortunately natural supplements as well. Uh, it's amazing how bad some of the products are on the market and the government's doing nothing about that. They're not going in the, in the factories and saying, Prove to me that your label is true. That would be great, but they don't do that. So the label may not have in it, uh, I mean on it, what's actually inside the bottle. Some studies have shown just buying CBD products and testing them out for just for proof, 90% are off what the label says in one way or another. And this is even more disturbing, um, there can be contaminants in there that you're not aware of. For instance, pesticide use in growing CBD is high because it creates more product which can be sold, but the pesticides end up in the final product. And there's other contaminants there, it can be there as well. And unfortunately in New Hampshire, a popular CBD distributor was arrested this year with counterfeit and contaminated products containing illicit THC. Again, I mentioned people can get high buying these locally and fentanyl in their product. So this is, a, this is in New Hampshire. So how do you find a good one? Um, this is something that I spend a lot of my time doing. When I work with people, I'm doing it in a professional manner. I have a consultation practice, and I recommend supplements for certain reasons. And I, might, I need to make sure that what I'm recommending is true, is accurate. So the companies we work with all do independent testing on their products to uh, verify that, they've, uh, that they are what they say they are. So in terms of looking around, we found a company um, that only, uses, only sells their product through pharmacists. In my opinion, because of this interaction with the endocannabinoid system and a potential for drug interactions, there should be counseling that's involved with this product. That's what we provide. I'm a pharmacist, nutritionist, and herbalist. And this company, an endo professional, only sells through pharmacists. They're, local, they're uh, located in Kentucky, um, and uh, they are um, uh, just really, really invested in proving the benefits of CBD at their own expense. So they are the first company to receive what's called an IND, Investigative New Drug Approval, for FDA clinical trials. So right now, there are probably a dozen different studies going on that are using a nanoprofessional's product um, and to see the benefit that can be shown through the use of these products. And in addition, I mentioned um, knowing what's in it. There's a QR code on every bottle, 
and that gives you access to the actual a certificate of analysis done by a lab independent of the owner, the people who make the product, uh, to verify that this is pure and potent and free of toxins. So, and this is actually, um, I've been down to their their facility two times, and so uh, there there I am amidst the product. And as a pharmacist who graduated in the 70s, I never thought I'd be standing in a hemp field, but. That's the way life works out. Okay, so let's talk about the different applications for CBD for health. These are, these are some, some studies. Uh, this is from Frontiers in Psychiatry. The title of the study, Prospects for the Use of Cannabinoids in Psychiatric Disorders. And some of the results seen, health benefits of CBD from this study showed benefit in anti-anxiety as an antidepressant, pain relieving, analgesia, uh, it helps with sleep, suppresses waking up, regulates sleep disorders, and neuroprotection. This would be nerve conditions like, say, Parkinson's disease, um, other conditions like that. It helps with uh, supporting the health of those, those conditions. And then in terms of pain, uh, this study, this is one of the studies done by an endoprofessional. Dr. Alex Capano, the first author mentioned there on the left, is the chief medical officer for Ananda Professional. And she's the one who's behind a lot of these. Uh, the goal here was to see how can this affect pain. And the title of the study, again, Evaluation of the Effects of CBD Hemp Extract on Opioid Use and Quality of Life Indicators in Chronic Pain Patients, a Prospective Cohort Study. So in this case, there were 131 people in this study, all of them, had been on a stable opioid dose for a year. So they're on prescription, could be Oxycontin, it could be morphine, it could be a bunch of different things, but they were on a stable dose for one year. Then the only thing that was different was they added CBD to their daily dose for, didn't change their opioid dose uh, uh, when they started, and they went on this for daily for eight weeks. At the end of that time, the results were 53% of the patients had either stopped or decreased their opioid use after adding the Ananda Professional Soft Gels. They, in this case, they gave capsules, so they had more control over the dosing. If you're doing oil, you don't know, did you take the right amount? So they're using a discrete dosage to make sure that it's, it's consistent for everybody. And then in addition, 94% reported better sleep or less pain. In my mind, with the opioid crisis, this is huge. This is where doctors should be going. And yet, this study is, I think it's 2019. And here we are four years later, and I'm not hearing a lot about this. They should be all over this. Here's another study, substituting cannabidiol for opioids and pain medications among individuals with fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is a chronic pain condition where um, you just hurt all the time. Uh, you may have a level 8 to 10 pain every day. So it's, it's really a very, very difficult condition um, and a lot of, unfortunately, not a lot of help in pharmaceuticals for them. So in this case, these people with fibromyalgia went on uh, CBD products and 72% Sub, had substituted CBD for their pain medications. So they were able to substitute CBD instead of their pain medications. CBD was also substituted, 53.3% uh, were able to reduce, remove it and replace their opioids. 23.1% were able to reduce or remove the benzodiazepams, which is products like Xanax and Valium for more um, anxiety for relaxation and then NSAIDs, which would be like ibuprofen, 59% 59% reduction, and gabapentinoids. These are there's a drug called gabapentin that's for nerve pain specifically, and one of the primary products used in fibromyalgia, um, and a 35% reduction of gab gabapentinoids in that. So overall, they had a 70 to 94% reported that substitution resulted in stopped or reduced use of medications. Participants had substituted. The, you know, to CBD for various reasons. One is they didn't want to have the side effects, so they're motivated to try something different uh, to get away from the drug side effects. 
And then CBD products that also contain THC had higher odds of substitution and greater symptom relief. So again, you're dealing with did they use a full spectrum product or not, and the full spectrum product had a better result. They both had results, but the full spectrum had a better result. So that is one of the benefits of using the, the uh, full spectrum product. In regard to sleep, this study, reasons for cannabinoid use, a cross-sectional study of CBD users focusing on self-perceived stress, anxiety, and sleep problems. And again, some of the benefits, I sleep better, it's around 40%. Um, you know, I, I feel a deeper sleep, it's 20 plus percent. I wake up less, 15% you know, or whatever. So you can see an overall benefit for this particular use as well. And then how about mood? Um, they do different um, evaluation parameters to assess how you're doing. So they call them either a Beck anxiety inventory, they ask questions and see how people do over time, or this overall anxiety severity impairment scale. These are considered professional evaluation tools. Um, so we go from the, in the, the Beck anxiety, the blue one, we go from uh, a score of around 20, which is considered moderate, down to a score of about five, uh, which is considered minimal in four weeks. And then the other one for the anxiety um, severity scale, the orange one, it started up around 12, which is more in the severe category, down to about four, which again is in the mild, mild range over four weeks. So has is, is it been shown to help with neurodegeneration? This is another study called cannabinoids and modulation of oxidate signaling. Uh, oxidative signaling refers to damage that happens. Uh, we take antioxidants like vitamin C to prevent cellular damage that can happen with various reasons in our body. Um, so that when you have oxidative damage, it creates problems. In this case, on the left, you see a neuron, which is a nerve. And then on the right, you see a damaged neuron. Uh, I guess these are, these are a depiction, but that's kind of the sense. You're, you're, you're losing a lot of of a degeneration. So you have the, the neurodegeneration disease occurring from left to right. Then the introduction of CBD, it goes in the opposite way and helps to restore the health of those neurons. So kind of a summary overall for um, uh, the, the benefit of CBD. Pain, things like osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, neuropathic pain, musculoskeletal pain, menstrual pain, spine pain, fibromyalgia, technically any pain. Um, some are more, again, you could do more immediate. Uh, by the way, did anybody see a change with what you applied? How much? I have a lot of just nothing too bad. I think overall. Okay, so overall general. How about you? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Oh, okay. okay, all right. That's just, and that's the, we have four topicals, that's the second weakest that we have. So we, that's the, you know, a low level. I did that because it's easy to, to uh, sample a, a pump lotion. We have a, a salve, which is in a jar. We have the lotion, that, the salve is the lowest, the, then the lotion. Then we have two different roll-ons. Um, one is middle and then the other one's higher. So the, the roll-ons are more popular, but it's easier to dispense that way. Uh, so again, it shows you the value of pain management, and it, the same thing works when you take it internally. For sleep, helping to fall asleep, stay asleep. For mood, depression, anxiety, PTSD, neuroprotection, Huntington's disease, again, these are nerve conditions, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, are showing um, benefit. And again, the research is exploding, and hopefully we'll see some really great information coming forward more over time. So the question is, how do you actually take it? First of all, topical for localized pain. You can just apply it to the area when you feel you need to, um, but then you can also use it in conjunction with oral products. With the topical, you'd apply it, and then it will finally wears off over time, then just apply it again, and then it wears off over time, you apply it again. So you're just applying it locally. Uh, when you take it internally, you're trying to get a blood level internally. The topical does not affect your blood level, so they can be used together and you don't really change your oral dosing because you're on topical. So in terms of internal, um, what you're trying to do here would be, this is more for conditions that like, like mood, sleep, and then if you have large areas of pain and inflammation, generalized body inflammation, 
there's a lot of research indicating that every health condition, negative health condition we have is centered in inflammation. And I think that's where, again, where using CBD as a, as a maintenance, I take it personally, I don't have any of the problems that they describe here. Um, in fact, I thought I slept well before taking it, and I couldn't believe how much better it was after taking it. Uh, so it's just one of those things, uh, it's, they're all individual, but I'm using it as a nutritional supplement, not as a specific um, therapeutic effect. So dosing is different for everybody. Um, it's kind of like you need to put oil in your car, but you don't have a dipstick. So you put in a little, and then you see what's going on, and a little more. So you, it's called dosing low and slow. You would increase the dose every three days. On, you start with one dose, in this case, 10 milligrams, um, which the product we recommend most people start with is a, it would be a half a dropper full of oil. And you would put that underneath your tongue, hold it for a full minute before you swallow, eat, or drink. Then you go three days, and we actually give a sheet with a score, symptom score, so you can, reg you can watch over time what's changing, be objective about it. You do that days one through three, one, two, and three, and say you're trying to, you're trying to do it for, for pain, um, or again, sleep or mood. You do the same thing. You start with the 10 milligrams after day three, am I better? If the answer is yes, then that's your daily dose. That's the level you need to maintain your system. If you say no, either nothing's happened or I need more help, then you go to two doses, which in this case would be 20 milligrams, which would now be two half droppers or half full dropper full, and do that days four, five, and six. At the end of that time, same question, am I better or not? And you just work your way forward every three days uh, if you need to, and only 10 milligrams at a time. The reason that's important is because Colleen mentioned before that you can overwhelm your receptors. That's what the enzymes are there for, to help clear the area. You can get what's called resistance, and you don't want to dose too high too fast or you may get resistance in that area. It doesn't harm you, but you may not get the full effect that you get at actually at a lower dose. So dosing this way, we found to be the most effective in terms of general dosing for different conditions, this is not hard and fast. This is just what we see in our own store. In general, people with sleep issues, they need around 10 to 20 milligrams. People with mood issues, it might be more like 30 to 40 milligrams. And people with pain, it might be 50, 60 or more level. Generally, pain would be more uh, as a general rule of thumb. But again, you find that out by dosing. And let's just say you're dealing with, with all three. Um, you know, say you take a low dose and sleep is fine, but you still have anxiety and pain. You keep on going up until you get an answer about every product, every condition you're on. If you do get to the point where, hey, I got some benefit, I've increased a couple more times and I've had no change, then that may be all you're going to get out of it. It's hard to know. Um, there's the, the, the question about this is, why do we not know what your dose is? We don't know how deficient your endocannabinoid system is. So we're trying to merely make your endocannabinoid system as optimal as possible, but it may not be able to take care of you completely. Uh, for people that have had <clears throat> chronic conditions like severe inflammatory going on for a long time, their endocannabinoid system is depleted. You just can't make the, what's needed to keep up with the, the demand. So that's why the supplementing can often help take some of the edge off of what's going on. So in terms of uh, just some questions about it, will it make me sleepy? Generally, it's a relaxant, but it's not a sedative. I take it in the morning. It doesn't affect me at all. So you can dose any time of day, but it's designed to help enhance your sleep cycle. Whether you take it in the morning or evening, it's enhancing your sleep cycle. So some people do feel a little drowsy with it, or they just they feel relaxed when they've had it. So we recommend just taking it at nighttime. Uh, if you want to take it during the day, you can do that. But uh, nighttime is just a good time to take it. Will, you, will I fail a drug test? Again, I mentioned that before. The answer is possible. You want to be careful about that. Uh, but again, if they would be willing to do a confirmatory blood test, that would clean up the whole issue. There wouldn't be any problem. Um, is there a difference between using the oils under the tongue or capsules? And the same could be said for, can you take the oil and mix it with a smoothie and drink it down? 
there's a difference between putting the oil under your tongue because you absorb it and you're holding it for a minute so you absorb it right into your bloodstream from your mouth so your dose is getting into you yes you'll swallow it and you'll still get a little more out of it but most of it is getting into you right from under your tongue the capsules or chewies or if you swallow the oil they have to go through your digestive system and in that process you lose about a third of it so again where 10 milligrams would be an oral, an oral dose under the tongue 15 milligrams would be the dose our chewies are 15 milligrams our capsules are 15 milligrams but they're equal to a 10 milligram dose under the tongue but some people would jam traveling it's easier to take capsules or chewies whatever whatever's more convenient for you uh, but you do lose um, you do lose some and you're paying more for it because you're paying for milligrams you're not getting any benefit from but if it's the difference between using it or not using it that's certainly an opportunity are there side effects again it's it's very rare uh, this is where are you on medications talk to the pharmacist things like that yes it could possibly cause drowsiness it can potentially help normalize your blood pressure if you have normal blood pressure it's not going to lower your blood pressure if you're on drugs they may lower your blood pressure too much and that's true with any natural supplement as well if you have high blood pressure medication and you start add something into your regimen like vitamin D can regulate blood pressure, magnesium can regulate blood pressure, omega-3s can regulate blood pressure, but they don't lower your pressure too low. They want to bring it back to normal, and the drug wants to bring you lower. So you, you want to be real careful about how much you're, you're, you know, what you're taking, and if you start up, you do want to monitor that. And again, medication interactions are rare um, with the, this level of, uh, of CBD. Um, are there drug interactions it, there again at this the low low dose of milligrams like I mentioned it is not common to have side effects my caution is with any kind of blood thinner so we have special dosing for people on Coumadin or other other um, blood thinners it's more of a as a care uh, just a watchful care rather than a heart firm kind of thing but again Technically, if you're on other sedatives, they can have more drowsiness. Again, the blood pressure medications, antidepressants, there can be, you can get too much antidepressant effect. Like with Prozac, you can get what's called serotonin syndrome. In other words, you're getting too much effect, and that can have a negative effect on your body. So again, it might make it so you need less drugs, essentially, but you want to work with your doctor on that kind of thing, get their approval. Um, and then can oral and topical be used together? Yes. Um, so, for instance, if you have severe arthritis pain, it may take time to do the daily dose, three, six, nine days to get there, whereas you can apply the lotion or the roll-on right away and get benefit while you're waiting for the internal to, uh, you, and the way you'd know is you use your, your topical and then you don't need it again. So ideally, you wouldn't need the topical long term. Once you get on your oral dose, you may, that may be sufficient to carry you through. Um, so the again, conclusion to this is full spectrum hemp can provide a wide range of mental and health benefits. Uh, it really can be thought of as a filling, fulfilling a nutritional deficiency. So I consider it to be part of good health maintenance. And also, you can use this for your, your pets. Uh, we have a little 14-pound, uh, um, he's a uh, Jack Russell uh, min pin uh, mix, and he's a little bit active and we give him a daily dose and it really helps to smooth him out so they can use this just as well like going to the vet you know dosing before going to the vet things like that so pets find it to be very uh, helpful for their situations as well and then next time uh, we'll be talking about healthy digestion any questions today yes go ahead I was going to say it's very good because I mean I knew nothing about CBD. I, I, I heard 